Hey folks, folks, uh, it's time for the next uh, online lecture. I'm sorry for not doing this live today. I just um, couldn't get it together in time, but hopefully this Thursday we'll have it live and I'll let you know. Um, I just had a big deadline that's really kill crushing me. Um, plus I had already planned it uh, in a certain way and now I'm, now I'm changing it. Um, um, okay, so today the problem, the, uh, the deal is we will discuss uh, the many body wave function and um, symmetrization for identical particles. That's the plan for today. Um, and so last time we uh, introduced this topic by uh, pointing out that if I have a bunch of particles, and let's say a bunch of particles in a box, that's my favorite example, particle one, two, three, if they're all bouncing around in that box and I have some potential, they're living in that potential, then I can write the Hamiltonian for each of the particles is H1 plus H2 plus H3. And if the Hamiltonian for each particle is just the kinetic energy of that particle plus the potential energy of that particle, and if, and if no interactions between them then it's easy to find the many body wave function. And we went through the math using separation of variables last time, but I just want to remind you of the answer. And the answer is that uh, we have that the, the uh, uh, eigenstates, uh, then, then, well, what I should say is it's easy to find the eigenstates, the many body eigenstates, uh, where that's the many body wave function. So the many body, eigenstates are easy to find because we can find a the many body eigenstate uh, for particle one and two and three etc is simply equal to uh, we can just take the the eigenstates of the single particle Hamiltonian psi uh, one of x1 psi two of x2 psi three of x3 and and make a, a product state. So it's a product state. That's the word we use. Because it's the product of these different eigenstates where um, the different eigenstates are simply the eigenstates of the, uh, of the single particle Hamiltonian. I'll call this... Uh, I'll call that epsilon i, psi i, in which case the total energy is equal to the sum of the energies for each particle. Um, and that's a really famous result. Um, and it, it should, and so the, the, the product state should make sense from a probabilistic uh, argument, probability, because in probability, if if the particle is is uh, having if there are simultaneous things happening, then you multiply the probabilities. Simultaneous. When simultaneous things happen, then you multiply probabilities, and you you know that from probability. Like if I say. Um, What's the probability that I will flip flip a coin and get heads, and at the same time uh, that the coin will be o older than 1985? Then, then you, you multiply the probability to, to flip the coin and the probability that it's older than 1985. So you, you always multiply things. So this and that, you multiply probabilities. Okay, so, th so, so this is for, for the non-interacting case when the particles don't feel each other then this is the then this is the situation um, okay so um, and when it's interacting it's much more difficult but we won't worry about that now uh, but now let's talk about something something new there's a new idea and the new idea 
is that something tricky happens when the particles are indistinguishable. Things get tricky when particles are indistinguishable. And this is a big deal. And it's not obvious, but it's, it's actually quite beautiful and interesting. It's really kind of a cool thing that happens in quantum mechanics. Um, and so the idea is <clears throat> if we, so the I, idea is this, uh, let's consider a many body system, many body system of identical particles. And, 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 and here it is. Oh, damn it. So it's such a pain to use this iPad. So here are my particles. There's a whole bunch of them. One, two, three, four. Let's just say there's four, but there could be a, a, a gazillion. And, and so if I write down, um, uh, if I if I write down the particle, if I if I'm trying to figure out the wave function of all these particles that are living in this box, then I can see that uh, my equations are going to look like this. I'm going to have a Hamiltonian. H equals uh, p one squared over two m plus p two squared over two m, etc. Plus the potential energy of particle one, two, three, etc. So I'm going to have all these equations, uh, and I'm going to have then my many body wave function, which is going to be a function of x1 and x2 and x3, the positions of all these particles. Okay, and, and then I'm going to have my energy, which is going to be the energy of the different particles, etc. So you can see that the uh, my equations, to, to write down the equations, to make the equations make sense, then the particles have labels. Particles have labels. Exclamation point. I know this is kind of obvious, but it gets sort of tricky in a moment. So I want you to just understand this very simple fact that if I'm writing down the Hamiltonian and the potential and the wave function and the energy of the particles, then I'm writing these little, I have these little labels like particle one, particle two, particle three. The particles have labels, which means that if I go back here, then you can see that the particles have little labels. That particle is one, that particle is two, that particle is three, that particle is four. So all the particles are stamped they are stamped with little labels. They are stamped with little labels. Now, of course, in reality, they're not actually stamped. You know, there's no room to stamp a point particle, but it, theoretically, we stamp them in our minds. Uh, in, in our imaginations, we put little stamps on them. We have to, or otherwise the equations make no sense. They are meaningless. Okay, so that's that's kind of obvious when you think about it, I think, I hope. But now let's consider what happens. Then we can ask a really simple question. What happens if we, uh, if we flip the label, if we, if we switch two labels? So, in, so for example, what happens if I take this box and all the particles are sitting there? I got that guy there. And I got that guy there, and I got this guy there. I'm trying to draw the same picture, but now I have one. But now I'll call this guy particle two, and I'll call this guy particle three, and this guy particle four. So you see I have switched two labels. You can see it. Uh, before I had, I'll draw the dash around this. So these two guys, I, switch, I flip their labels. I just switched their labels. Um, and so And so now... I, I, I have to switch their labels in the equations. Then must switch labels in the equations. I have to switch now, wherever I see a label 2, I got to switch it for a label 3 and, and vice versa. So what happens physically when we do that? And the answer is that 
sort of <laughs> the answer is like physically if i how does this change then how does this change the physics how does this change the observable physics and the answer of course is that it doesn't it can't Swi because switching my imaginary labels should not change any of the observable physics the the hamiltonian should must remain the same the Hamiltonian must remain same. The observables must be the same. Observables must be unchanged. Think about it. It, it, it can't, this should not, this cannot, the, the names I give the particles cannot change the actual observables. The, uh, the, the energy, for example, the, the energy, the uh, probability density to find the particles at different locations which is equal to psi star psi, these things cannot be changed. Uh, okay, and so, um, so that's sort of obvious, uh, but it leads to something, some sort of interesting behavior, which is not obvious. Um, so, let's, so to try to figure out what that is, then let's, um, let's continue. And so to, to, to try to figure this out, let's, this means then that what I can do is I can define... An exchange operator. And let's give it a name. I'll call it PIJ. And what this exchange operator does is it exchanges labels. Labels uh, uh, for particle I and particle J. And so, in other words, um, if I have a semi, uh, if I have <clears throat> a many-body wave function, uh, let's write it down. If I have some many-body wave function, which is a, a wave function of particles one and two and three and i and j, etc., um, then if I hit it with this guy. P I J the the exchange operator, then what it does is it turns the wave function into this. It just switch flips the labels. Basically, it switches the labels that we have stamped on the two particles I and J. So the 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 wave function is the same except wherever I had an I, I now have a J, and wherever I had a J in my late in my equation, I now have an I. And that's all. So it's actually really simple and trivial, but it's but you know it's one of those simple things that you have to think about for a moment. For example, suppose let's just do an example. So suppose I had my wave function. Suppose I had a two particle wave function and my many body uh, uh, my many body wave function for two particles. Let's call them x one and x two. Suppose that they were um, x one squared times um, x two to the cube. That, that, so that could be my wave function, maybe, for some particular system, some weird system. And so then, if that's my wave function for the two particles, then let's hit that with the exchange operator, P12, for that many-body wave function. And so what I get now is a new wave function, which is, uh, now it'll be x2 squared times x1 cubed. See? That's it. So simple. Um, Okay, so uh, now, as I said before, if I hit a wave function w with this operator, then I can't. Then I should not really change. Uh, if if it's a if for identical particles, for identical particles, then it should not change the physics. Shouldn't change the physics. If the particles are not identical, then it can. But for identical particles, it should not change the physics. Um, okay, so let's continue and ask ourselves, what are the properties of this exchange operator? And we can see that uh, this exchange operator has, it's an operator. So then we can ask, uh, what, what are its eigenstates? What are its eigen, eigenvalues and eigenstates? And so uh, that's easy enough to find because to, to solve that, 
to find that, we just use we just uh, use our, our standard trick, and we say uh, p i j. We we take the operator and we act it on some hypothetical eigenstate, and we say, okay, well if that's an eigenstate, then I must get a constant times the state when I hit it with the operator, uh, where lambda is the eigenvalue. Um, and so then we can do something, then we can ask ourselves, you know, what does lambda equal? Well, to figure that out, let's do a trick. Let's hit it again. Let's hit it twice. Um, and so we'll hit it pij again. Let's hit it again. pij psi. And so then we see that that's just the same as hitting this, pij hitting that. And we see that the pij goes right through because lambda is a constant. And so then we see that it's equal to lambda squared psi. But then, but then we also know, but there's something else we know, because if I hit, if I hit a, a state with pij and then pij again, then we know that it must also equal the state itself. Because if I switch the two particles i and j and then switch them again, they go right back to where they were. And so, and so I must have that the pij operator is its own inverse. pij squared has to equal 1. And so that means then that lambda squared psi is equal to psi, the many-body wave function. And so we see then that lambda is equal to plus 1 and minus 1. So these are the eigenstate, eigenvalues of uh, pij. Okay, so I think that's fairly straightforward. Um, and we can also look a little bit more at this pij because for identical particles, for identical particles, then we can ask ourselves, does uh, we we can ask ourselves, does does it commute with the Hamiltonian? What is the what is the uh, the commutator between pij and the Hamiltonian? And intuitively, you you can think to yourself that it it should really commute because it's not changing the physics, and you can sort of do that. You can just you can just do this. Uh, you can. Um, because this is uh, the commutator is H uh, pij minus pij h, and we want to know what that equals, and so we can just uh, do this. We can we can take uh, we can look at this product. Uh, we can take pij and we can hit a many body wave function and then hit it on the left with the Hamiltonian, and we know that if the Hamiltonian is hitting this wave function where I've just exchanged the labels i and j, the energy should be the same. And so if this is an eigenstate psi, then the, uh, so if, if h times psi, if that's an eigenstate, then we know that h times p i j of psi, whoops, must also be an eigenstate. Um, and so if that's the case, then I can just write this as um, uh, En pij psi. And so then what I can do is um, I can just exchange these now since these are just that's just a constant so that's equal then to pij en psi and that of course is equal to pij h times psi and so then we have that h pi psi is equal to pi times h psi and so then we see that the hamiltonian commutes Okay, maybe that's sort of belaboring a point, but I just want you to, to understand, you know, that's, a, that's, that's, an, that's really quite important because what that means is that, is that if, if the Hamiltonian commutes with pij, 
then that means that the expectation value of the time rate of change of pij is zero. In other words, um, we see that this expectation value of the exchange operator is constant in time. In other words, it's conserved. It's a conserved quantity. Because because anything that commutes with the Hamiltonian is a is a conserved quantity, um, and so and so let's give it a name. Let's call this expectation value of the exchange operator since it's a conserved quantity. Let's give it a name. Let's call it the symmetry. And I know that that's a really overused word, but hopefully it'll become clear in a moment what we're talking about. So um, so that means that if a wave function has a, an expectation value of, of the exchange operator, then that is a, is a quantity that's a conserved quantity of a wave function. Conserved quantity for a physical system. And so we can ask ourselves then, what is it equal to? What the heck is it? What is this? Quantity. What what is this expectation value of the of the uh, exchange operator? Uh, and so let's let's, um, let's just consider it just for a moment, because here's the deal. We know. Then let's think about it for a moment. <clears throat> we we know that um, if I have a a physical quantity. For identical particles, and we're only talking about identical particles right now, identical particles, then if I consider a physical quantity like the um, like the uh, the probability density rho to find particles at certain locations, and that's just equal to the many body wave function star x one x two times the many-body wave function, x1, x2. Then I know then that if I exchange the two operators, then if I hit these, these two guys, uh, then it should, it should, with the exchange operator, then it should be unchanged. Because if I, if I consider now uh, pij times psi star, uh, P, I'm sorry, let's, let's get this right. If I now consider Pij acting on psi star uh, on uh, times Pij, the same wave function, then it should, it should be the same quantity because if I just exchange the labels x1, x2, x3, and this is... Let's do it like this. Let's call this xi, xj. And now if I have this xj, xi, then it should be, it should be the same. Uh, it, should, it should be the same. And so what that means then is that um, what that means then, it's, this has to equal the same, psi star psi. And so if these things are the same, then that means then that... Pij acting on this many body wave function uh, can only uh, change its phase. So it has to be some e to the i alpha. Um, and so um, and so then then because then if we, we see then that Pij psi star is going to be equal to e to the minus i alpha, and so when they hit each other, uh, I'm sorry, times psi, times psi. And so when they, and so when I, so then this, this ensures that this is true. And so we see then that the exchange operator acting on the many body wave function has to be multiplied by some phase. But then we can ask, well, what is that phase? Um, and so um, w it's actually pretty easy to figure that out because if, Pij acting on the many body wave function is equal to some phase 
then check it out. If I hit it twice, we know what happens because it has to come back to itself. Because, uh, and so PIJ, so if I act on it twice, it's going to be e to the 2i alpha psi. But we know that, that because this is equal to 1, uh, and so then I see that I have to have uh, this relationship. And so that tells me then that 2i alpha has to equal... Uh, I'm sorry, let me get that right. That tells me then that 2 alpha has to equal 0 or 2 pi. And so that means then that alpha has to equal 0 or pi. Wow, that's like a, a big result. So that means then that um, if I have a many-body wave function of identical particles and I hit it with pij, then I know that it's going to be either... Um, e to the i0, well, let's just call that, uh, let's just make that simpler to say because we then know that e to the i0 is equal to 1 and e to the i2 pi, um, I'm sorry, e to the i0 is 1 and e to the i pi is equal to negative 1. And so we see that pij psi is either going to equal plus 1 times psi or minus 1 times psi. And so what that means then is that what we see then is that the expectation value of pij, which is equal to psi pij psi, is going to have to equal, you guessed it, either plus 1 or minus 1. So that is the expectation value of the exchange operator. It's got to be equal to plus 1 or minus 1 for a wave function. Uh, but then we can ask the question, which one is it? Which one is it? So, so far, uh, this has all been sort of easy in a way. I mean, it might seem hard when you're seeing it for the first time, but once you go through these notes and think about it, I think everything we've done up till now is pretty easy. But now I'm asking you a really hard question. Uh, if I have some system of particles, some many-body state for some arbitrary system of identical particles, um, then which one is it? Is PIJ, is the, is the expectation value of the exchange operator, plus one or minus one? Which one? It's got to be one or the other. We just proved it using this very simple physical reasoning. But which one is it? Well, that's a hard question. That is not obvious at all. And to answer that question, but there is an answer. And to answer that question, we need to use, you guessed it, relativistic quantum field theory. Yay, quantum field theory. Just what we wanted. Relativistic quantum field theory, something, of course, of which we know nothing. So, um, okay, so that's why it's a hard question to answer. But luckily, there are some smart people who understand relativistic quantum field theory, and, and they can tell us the answer. So we don't have to learn relativistic quantum field theory, at least not yet. You might want to learn it a little later on, but not today. Uh, today, we'll, we'll, we, won't, we won't learn relativistic quantum field theory, but we will just take it as a given that from relativistic quantum field theory, uh, it, you can prove something super interesting. And the super interesting thing that we can prove is this. We can prove that, um, that the, um, we, can, we can prove that a system of particles, uh, we can prove what we, what we like to call uh, the uh, spin statistics theorem. The spin statistics theorem. And this is a big deal, and you guys have already heard of this, but but now you'll see it again. Um, the the uh, what we'll find what the spin statistics theorem is that is that um, if I have a system of identical particles, then um, the many-body wave function. Of that system of particles 
must be an eigenstate of the PIJ of the exchange operator and the eigenvalue depends on the spin of the particles. And you've probably seen this before. Um, if the particles, if, if the particles have an integer spin, then the eigenvalue is equal to plus one. And that's the eigenvalue of the, of the exchange operator. But if the particles have uh, a half integer spin, let me write this down correctly. I don't want to screw this up. Then the, the eigenvalue of the exchange operator is negative 1. And so these particles that have integer spin, we give them a name. We call them bosons. And these particles that have half integer spin, we give them a name. We call them fermions. And we have to spell it right. Fermions. And this is a really big deal. This is a huge big deal. Um, and so... Um, uh, that is the spin statistics theorem, uh, and so this is this is a profound and important uh, fact of life, and this leads to many interesting behaviors. For example, for uh, fermions, this leads to the very famous Pauli exclusion principle. This is where the Pauli exclusion principle comes from. So what we did today is more fundamental than the Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, but the Pauli exclusion principle is a consequence of what we just of what I just said, and for bosons, this leads to other interesting behavior such as uh, Bose-Einstein condensation, which I'm not going to talk about, but you can go look it up, and it, it is a consequence of, of of what I of what we're talking about right now. Um, okay, but let's consider. But let's let's talk about uh, let's let's look at some examples of how this affects everyday life. Uh, and uh, I mean, this this is such a big deal. For example, this Pauli exclusion principle. This also leads to, for example, magnetism. You would not have magnetism if it wasn't for this. Uh, and so let's consider some examples of how this affects uh, the behavior of systems of of uh, multiple particles. Um, so um, let's consider the most important particle of all, which, in my opinion. Is of course the electron, and that's as I said before. I'm a condensed matter guy, and condensed matter people love electrons because, and when you have crystals and solids, all the properties really are, uh, come from the electrons, which are buzzing around. Uh, and so let's consider electrons, and the electron, as you know, has spin one half, and so the electron is a, you guessed it, a fermion. Yay, fermions. Um, and so let's consider uh, the many body wave function of, um, of some uh, of an electron. Uh, and so what that means then is that if I have a, a, a many body wave function of, let's say, uh, so let's say that I have a part of a system of electrons, um, uh, x1. Particle one, particle two, uh, particle i, particle j. So then, if I hit that um, th with uh, the exchange operator p i j, then it has to be equal to um, psi many body. X one, X two, 
xj, xi, then that has to equal the original one, but with a negative sign, psi, many body, x1, x2, xi, xj. Okay, and so this is this is the property. So uh, it's kind of simple in a way, but it's sort of weird and profound at the same time. Um, and so, and of course, if I had if I had a system of bosons, then that that sign would be this would be a plus sign if bosons, like in bosons, of course, an example of bosons would be say photons, for example. Okay, so um, so what is the what are the consequences of this? Um, what are the consequences of this? The main consequence, the, the, the most practical consequence, is that w w what happens is that this is telling us that if, if you have a system of multiple identical particles, then the many-body wave function must be symmetrized. That's the word we use, must be symmetrized and it must be symmetrized and what that means is that we is that that many body wave function must be uh, constructed in such a way that that if I hit it with an exchange operator any exchange operator that switches the labels of any two particles then it has to either equal plus one or minus one uh, times the many body wave function depending on whether it's um, depending on whether it's of bosons or fermions depending on whether it's fermions or bosons so this is the main consequence and and this might seem sort of simple and trivial compared you know cons considering all the things we've already been talking about <clears throat> but it's actually uh, sort of a tricky thing because constructing a symmetrized wave function is not is not completely totally obvious how to do that. Uh, for example, let's 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 do it right now. Let's 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 construct a let's construct a many body wave function. Let's construct the many body wave function right now and let's see how we deal with all this symmetrization stuff. And so let's let's consider my favorite situation, my favorite wave function which of course is particle in a box, particle in a box. I love particle in a box. And everything at some level you can think of as a particle in a box in my opinion. And so let's consider a box and let's put some particles in it. <clears throat> so let's just say that this part, this box is, is has, has a length from zero to one. I'll put a little glitch in the corner there, but just ignore that. And so then you know uh, that um, from last semester, you guys know that I'm going to get a bunch of energy levels. I'll draw three of them. And this one I'll call, uh, you know what the ground state looks like. It looks like this. Well, that's a pretty bad drawing, but whatever, good enough. And then the next excited state has a node, and the next excited state has two nodes, etc. You guys know this. <clears throat> and so this one, we'll call this, part of, we'll call this wave function A, is equal to uh, sine um, pi x. And because I made the length equals to 1, that makes everything sort of simpler. Um, and so let's call this one, and, and maybe I'm being a little sloppy with the normalization, but let's go with it because that, that's not the main point right now. Psi b is going to be equal to sine 2 pi x and psi c, the third the third one is is going to be sine, you guessed it, three pi x. Okay, so so this is a this is a typical uh, particle, a typical potential well, v of x, and these are the the eigenstates, right? And you know that we're going to have each of these eigenstates are going to have energies. This has some energy e a. This has some energy EB, and this has some energy EC, and you, there's some formula for it that you guys all learned last semester. I'm not even going to bother writing it down. But what I want to do now is I want to put two particles uh, into 
uh, this, uh, I want to put two particles into this box. Put two particles into the box. And let's make sure they're identical. Two identical particles into the box. And let's, let's call them, um, let's say, electrons. And you can actually do this. You know, we, we, people do this in the laboratory. I mean, this is, I mean, I've done this. You can actually do this. Uh, this is not just hypothetical. People actually do this in the laboratory. So let's put two identical particles into that box. And then I can ask, you know, what's the wave function? And so let's figure it out. So let's let's construct a wave function. So uh, the question is, where do those two particles go? So w to construct the wave function, what we do is just we just put the particles into different states. It's so simple. Just stick them into whatever states you want and see what happens. So let's put them both. Let's put one in part. Let's do this. Let's put one of them here in Psi A, and let's put the other one here. Okay? You see these little dots? There and there. So that means then that my many body wave function, which is a function of the two particles, x1 and x2, I can now write it as the product of those two. Because let's assume, let's, and of course we're assuming no interactions. And if there's no interactions between the particles, then we know how to write the many-body wave function. It's just the product of the two single particle wave functions. So if I put the one particle in psi A and the other particle into psi B, then the many-body wave function is going to be, we'll call this particle 1, and we'll call this particle 2, because the particles have to be labeled. And so particle 1 will be, so the many-body wave function will be psi A of x1 and psi B of x2. And so th that's an actual function. So that's going to be sine of pi x1 times sine of 2 pi x2. Okay, so I just constructed a many body wave function. And so now I'm going to, so now let's, and, and this, and this solves the Schrodinger equation. It, we did, because from last lecture, we know it solves the Schrodinger equation where the Schrodinger equation is this, h psi equals e psi, and we know that the uh, energy is just going to be equal to the sum of the two energies, ea plus eb. That's what we did last lecture. So this is a perfectly val this is a, so this is a, n a good state, it's a nice state, solves the Schrodinger equation, has a well-defined energy. But, I'm not, but now I'll ask you a question, is it physical? Can it actually happen in nature? Is it physical? And when someone says, is it physical, what they mean is, can it actually happen in, in, in nature? And, and so let's check it out. And so to see if it can, is physical, let's hit it with the exchange operator. P, 1, 2, acting on that many-body wave function. And what P, 1, 2 does is it swaps the labels. So let's swap those labels. And it's sine uh, pi x2 times sine of 2 pi x1. I swap the labels. And so now let's add, and so now I'm going to ask you, is this equal to plus 1 or minus 1 times the original wave function? Psi many body, which of course was uh, sine of pi x1 times sine of 2 pi x2. So are these two functions related by a plus one or a minus one? And just look at them. And this is not a trick question. It's an actual question. And, you know, you guys have all taken math. Look at those two equations. Are they the same? Uh, are they related by a plus one or a minus one? And the answer is no. So this many-body wave function, P12 psi many-body wave function, does not equal plus one or minus 1 times the old uh, many-body wave function. And so that means it's not physical. That means it cannot happen in nature. And so that's pretty profound, because that means even though this wave function 
this wave function right here, um, this, this wave function, uh, psi many body here, even though this wave function solves the Schrodinger equation, has a well-defined energy, it cannot occur for a system of two identical particles because it is not an eigenstate of the exchange operator. So how do we make it into an eigenstate of the exchange operator? Well, let me, let me show you how, let me just uh, show you how to do it. If I have, uh, what I can do is I can put the two particles into these two states, psi A and psi B, but I gotta, but I gotta construct my wave function in a really weird way. Check this out. If I construct it like this, psi many body is equal to, uh, if I construct it like this, psi A of x1 times psi B of x2, where, where the, the psi A and the psi B are the sine pi x1 and sine 2 pi x, 2 pi x. If I, if I have it this product, but then if I also do this, suppose I say minus, and now I say psi A of x2, psi B of x1, okay? So suppose I make this. Now let's, let's consider this. Now let's hit that with the P12, the exchange operator. And now check it out. I'm gonna, now I'm gonna ch exchange those labels, psi A of x2, psi B of x1 minus Psi A of X1, Psi B of X2. See, I exchanged the labels in my wave function, but now check it out. Let's compare these two things. And, and we notice something quite beautiful, which is that P1, 2, Psi many body is equal to negative uh, the original wave function. So this wave function is properly symmetrized. So that means that this wave function is physical. So this wave function is physical. It can happen. And of course, if we look at the energy of this wave function, we just have to hit it with the Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian is H1 plus H2. And I'll leave it as an exercise to show that H times this many body wave function is equal to uh, the energy Ea plus Eb times the many body wave function. And you guys should show that yourself. Hit it. Do it yourself and show that it really is, that this really happens. So this is an exercise. Show this. And if, if it makes no sense what I'm saying, then you should talk to the TA to figure, you know, to... to if, if what I'm asking you to do makes no sense, then please talk to the TA uh, and, get, and get this straightened out because this will then show you that the energy of this state is Ea plus Eb. So this state, and this is a really weird state, let's go, it's this state up here. It has, it is a physical state. It is a eigenstate of the exchange operator uh, where the, uh, you can see that the, it symmetrized the, the, uh, um, and the, and the, uh, I can say uh, the eigenvalue of the exchange operator is minus one, which it should be for for fermions, um, and and it has a well-defined energy. So this is a good state. Okay, but when you look at that, it's kind of weird, and you might ask yourself, how did I, how did I know about that? How did I know? How did I figure that out? Where did that state come from? What is the rule? How do we construct these weird states? How do we construct? these symmetrized eigenstates in general because i just did that for a system of two particles but what if i had three particles or four particles or a million particles how do we construct symmetrized states and it turns out that there's a trick there's a really cute math trick that allows us to do this it's a math trick and the math trick is to use what we call a slater determinant <clears throat> and this is the general trick for creating symmetrized wave functions. So this allows us to create uh, symmetrized, fully symmetrized wave functions for uh, systems of identical particles. Systems of identical particles.
particles. So let's talk about what a Slater determinant is. Um, okay, so let's talk. Let's do a Slater determinant. So let's consider n identical particles. And let's assume that they are not interacting. That's always a good starting point. We can turn the interactions on later as a perturbation or, well, let's not worry about the interactions for now. Uh, and then what we can do is we can ask ourselves, how do we construct, construct the, uh, uh, a physical many body state of those n particles, x1, x2, xn? How do we construct a physical state that has, for example, where the energy is equal to E1 uh, plus E2 plus E3? How do we construct this state? Well, here's the trick. Let's do it right now. Here's the big trick. I'll call that the nth eigenstate, psi n, for this system of n particles. Big n, number, big n is the number of particles, and that little n is the eigenstate, and this is equal to some constant, A, times, here it comes, a determinant. And the determinant is like this, psi A, so that's the eighth state of the Hamiltonian of particle one, psi A, of particle two. Let me just write it down. Uh, once you see it in all its glory, then you can figure it out. Then it makes more sense. Uh, psi b is another state, and I put particle one into state psi b. Now I'm going to put particle two into state psi b, and now I'm going to put uh, the nth particle into state psi b state number b and then i go uh, all the way down to some arbitrary state psi i'll call it um x1 and i'll put particle two into this state psi that's particle two living in state psi and then i'll put particle n into state psi x n and this is a determinant Okay, this is the wave function, this, this determinant. And so let's, let's just write it all down before we look at the details. Uh, and so here I have n states. The states are enumerated by the rows because, see, this is, um, you can see how this is the eighth state. This is the state B, and this is state C. So that's the rows. And then um, the columns tell me the, the particles. We can see that there's n particles from the columns because, see, this is column 1. So in this column, all the states have particle 1. In the second column, all the states have, are particle 2. And in the, third, in the last column, all the states are particle n. So uh, I want you to see how this is a it's a it's a matrix it's a determinant, and the the rows. The rows uh, identify the, the the which state, and the columns identify which particle. And let's continue, because then we have the normalization a. A, the normalization, uh, is equal to 1 over square root of n factorial for fermions and something more complicated for bosons. Um, 1 over square root of n factorial times n sub a factorial times n sub b factorial, etc. 
for bosons where Na is equal to the number of part of uh, where Na is equal to the number of particles in state A, number of particles in psi sub A, and Nb equals the number of particles in psi sub B, etc. Okay, so that is the wave function, and and it's a determinant. Uh, but uh, so for fermions, it's a normal determinant. Normal determinant. But for the bosons, what we do is we switch all the minus signs into plus signs in the determinant. And so that might seem kind of weird, but it's just a math trick. Uh, and so that's how we write the Slater determinant. Um, and so... Um, what um, is is so so? L let's take a look at this. Let's for let's let's take a look at it first for the fermions. And there's something quite beautiful about this determinant construction because immediately you can see how it satisfies the symmetrization um, of. Uh, you can see how it satisfies the symmetrization properties because here you can see for. Uh, if I, if I, uh, what you can see is that um, if I, um, w what you can see is that particle exchange, which is the action of the exchange operator, is equivalent to swapping two columns. And so take a look at it, because now if I was to hit this thing with the operator 1, 2, then that's equivalent to switching, sw swapping column, columns 1 and 2. You can see that, because if I, if I change the labels of, of this column and this column from 1 to 2, then it's just I'm just swapping those two columns, and 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 when you swap two columns in a determinant, then uh, something that you know from linear algebra is that uh, swapping columns in a determinant uh, is the same as multiplying times negative one, and so that's a trick. So uh, that's a linear algebra trick. So we know that that swapping two columns multiplies uh, uh, the determinant times negative one in linear algebra. So that's kind of beautiful, and so that tells me immediately that that this construct is satisfying the symmetrization. So swapping any two columns uh, um, is is uh, g gives me the negative sign. Uh, also, something else is uh, for fermions. Then, if 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 two if if two columns, I'm sorry, if two rows are identical, then we see that the determinant equals zero. And so you can see immediately that if if I put uh, if if two columns if if two rows are identical then that's the same as, the, as putting two particles in the same state. And so uh, take a look at, the, at, this, uh, at this determinant and you can see that if I labeled, uh, if I labeled this row with A, if I replace those guys with a, for example, then I would have then that's the same uh, as as putting uh, two particles in the same state 
and then the determinant is zero, uh, which means that it can't happen. It means that it can't happen in the sense that then the wave function is zero. And for the wave function to be zero is the same as saying it cannot happen. So that that is, and what is that? That is the Pauli exclusion principle. So the Pauli exclusion principle is an unavoidable uh, is an unavoidable consequence of the anti-symmetrization of the fermionic wave function. So for fermions, then can't put two particles in the same state. And if you if you don't understand what that means, then just uh, take a look at this at this Slater determinant, and and just notice that if the um, if I put if I have the same label, then the two call rows are the same, and and so the determinant is zero because if two rows are the same, that's a property of linear algebra. If two rows of a determinant are the same, then the determinant is zero. And if, if you don't know about that, then you know go maybe go and look at a book in a linear algebra book to remind you of that because that's sort of like one of those uh, common linear algebra uh, tricks. So now let's look at for okay. So now let's look at for bosons. For bosons, then what we have is it's okay to put multiple state to put multiple particles in the same state. And that's okay. And you can see that it's okay because here you can see that in my determinant, when I'm constructing my determinant and, and calculating it, then you can see that if, if, if I get rid of all the negative signs in the determinant, then it's okay if, my, if I have the similar rows. So if I had three rows with, all with the same uh, subscript, that's the same as putting three particles in the same state. And, and then the, you, the, that trick that the determinant goes to zero won't happen if I, if I make all the negative signs positive. Okay, so that's a lot of words. And, you know, I'm sorry for so many words, but uh, what I think that uh, the easiest thing really is to just uh, do an example. So let's do some examples because just doing all these words... Um, uh, you know, they all start, your, your eyes are probably glazing over now and you're probably just, you know, it becomes hard to follow when someone's just blathering on and on. So let's do some examples. So let's consider the simplest example of two particles. And so I, I showed you the Slater determinant first for the most general case because it, it, I'm going to show you right now an example for two particles, but it, it, the Slater determinant works just as well for a hundred million billion particles, you know, Avogadro number of particles. It, it, it's the same idea, but, but it's hard to write out the wave function for a hundred billion particles. So let's just do two instead. Uh, and so let's consider uh, two um, non-interacting particles. And, and let's put them in, into uh, uh, a box, and let's, let's consider them, let's put into a box my favorite, uh, my favorite Hamiltonian. So we, we have to, let's consider the single particle Hamiltonian first, single particle Hamiltonian. And so the single particle Hamiltonian will be this. We're going to put them into a box. And so that box will be of, say, some length L. And these walls are infinite, and so I'm going to get a bunch of states. Oops. Um, and so here's here's my uh, my particle, my states. I got all these states, and so this will be state A, state B, state C, etc. And so I have all my my wave functions where you know that my, my wave function psi j is going to equal square root of 2 over L sine of uh, nj pi x over L. Okay, and, and then I have my 
<clears throat> my energy as well. And there'll be some energy for that stay, and I won't even bother writing that down. But you know it from last semester. And and for now, let's just ignore spin. We'll deal with spin next next time. Let's ignore spin for now. Um, and so let's consider what happens when I have two particles, and I'm going to stick them, and I'm going to let's take the two particles and put them into the box. Put two particles in box, and then the question becomes, what happens? What happens? So uh, let's consider, but so what happens really depends on whether they're fermions or bosons. So let's consider the first case, fermions. And so for the first case, uh, we have to, we can put them into a box and let's put, let's put them, let, we have to decide which states do we put them in, which states. Because you have two particles and so you have to then decide two states. It could be any two states. Let's pick, let's pick A and B. So I'll put one particle here and one particle there. So I'll call that particle one and particle two. Okay, and psi A and psi B. I could have picked any two states, but I pick A and B. So let's see what happens. So I pick, so I put the two particles in those two states because you gotta, you gotta put each particle into a state. And now let's ask, what is the wave function? Psi many body equals what? So let's, let's use the Slater determinant. So let's write it out. Psi many body of the two particles, particle one and particle two, uh, is equal to one over the square root of n factorial, which is two, two factorial, and I got it. It's a it's a determinant, and so now I I have to make my determinant. So it's it's going to be a two by two determinant, and so the first the and the row is labeled by the state. And so the, the first one is, is state A, particle 1, and the next element is state A, particle 2, and then the next row is, is the second state, which is state B. Whoops. Um, state B, particle 1, and state B, particle 2. This is, this is just the construct. So now i got to calculate this determinant. And so it's going to be this minus this, right? That's how you do determinants. And so, so the many body wave function is equal to 1 over square root of 2 times, let's do it, psi a x1 times psi b x2 minus psi b x1 times psi a x2. So that is my many body wave function. And so let's take a look at that. Um, I am having a little problem here. The, my iPad has frozen up. All right, let's do that. Let's go back to that. Why has it frozen up? Why has it frozen up? <sighs> oh, this is really annoying. Maybe I'll do that. This is the first time this has happened to me. Why did it freeze up? It's probably some very simple thing. I probably hit something weird. Well, let's try to erase something. All right, that erased. Now it came back. Oh, okay. Now it's working again. All right. Jesus Christ, fucking piece of shit thing. Okay. So, um, 
Good, so that's the many body wave function. You can see it there. Uh, and so now let's uh, take a look at it and let's just to, to, just to make sure, let's hit it with the exchange operator. P12, psi many body. Uh, and then let's hit it with that exchange operator, which exchanges um, those labels. And so now I have psi A of x2, psi B of x1, minus psi B of x2, and psi A of x1. And I want you to take a look at that, and I want you to, to notice that these things are related by a negative sign. So one of them is equal to the negative of the other. Uh, and that's quite beautiful. And so we can see then that P12 of psi many body is equal to negative psi many body. And so then this many body wave function here that we just wrote is physical. It's allowed by nature, allowed by nature, because it's symmetrized and has the right symmetry. It has the right uh, eigenvalue of the exchange operator. Um, and so that's really quite cool. Um, and then also you can check to see that if I hit this many body wave function with the Hamiltonian, where the Hamiltonian is H1 plus H2, that's for the, the Hamilton, that's the energy of particle one, particle two, then you can see that the Hamiltonian acting on the many body wave function is equal to uh, energy A plus energy B acting on the wave function. And I leave that as an exercise to you to show. And so then we can see then that the energy of this state is, is just the sum of energy A and energy B. So we have figured out an allowed uh, wave function. Uh, but now we can ask ourselves, then we can ask ourselves, what's an excited state? Um, and, and so we can say, what's an excited state? Um, excited state? And to make an excited state, what we can do is we can put the particles, if this is psi A, and this is psi B, and this is psi C. Uh, now before we put the particles in psi A and psi B, particle one and particle two, but now what we can do to make an excited state, we can put particle two up here into psi C. And so this is an excited state. And so then we can see then that we can construct the excited state wave function, uh, which then is, is going to be, <clears throat> uh, which is going to be then uh, psi many body, and the excited state will be 1 over square root of 2 factorial times this, psi a of x1, and so we have particle 1, one of the particles is in psi a, and now the other particle is in psi c. So let's get that correct. Psi c of x1. Uh, and, um, and psi c of x2. And so we can do that. And so then that is gives us the, the, the allowed wave function. And uh, I won't write it all out. But then you can see then that if we do the same uh, argument, you can see then that the energy of the excited state will be Ea plus Ec. So we've just so this is the next uh, ex, the next higher state. So that's the I'll call that the excited the next the the excited energy the next higher level next higher level. Now. So now, but now let's ask ourselves, what happens if those particles are bosons? What about bosons? Let's make the particles into bosons. And so let's do the same thing, but for bosons. So now let's have the same, the very same well, psi A, psi B, psi C, the same potential. But now if let's, let's have, let's put, put two bosons into the box, put two bosons in box, then what is the allowed wave function? And what is the allowed energies? And so let's do it. Um, so let's, let's put, so where do we put the two particles? 
Now, we could put them in the same place, Psi A and Psi B, but let's try it differently. Let's do something different. Let's put the two particles into the same state. Let's put them both into Psi A. That's particle one and that's particle two. Let's put them both into Psi A and see what happens. So then we have Psi, um, uh, let's do it. So we have Psi A, I'm sorry, let's, let's get this right, I wanna, so we have the, the many body wave function. And so it's gonna be a function of the two particles, x1, x2. And so let's get the normalization correct. It's square root of uh, two factorial times uh, two factorial, uh, because I have, because that's the rule from above. You just look at it to, to remind yourself. And now I have to take this, the Slater determinant of psi a x1, psi a x2. So I put, so that's the state for the two particles. And then the next one is going to be psi a x1, psi a x2, because the two states are the same. So that's my determinant. Um, but now, now, okay, so that's my wave function. But now let's look at this for a second, because remember, if this was the fermionic, if these were fermions, then when I do the determinant, then it would equal zero for a regular determinant. For a regular determinant, it would equal zero, because I would just have, one, I'd just go this minus that, and they're, and, uh, and they're the same, and it would just go to zero. But now, uh, and that's why this could not work for fermions. But now, it's not a regular determinant because remember the rule is that I turn turn all the minuses into pluses. Turn minuses into pluses for bosons. So that's the rule. That's the Slater determinant rule. The I'll call it the Slater rule. Slater rule, the Slater determinant rule for bosons. And so now let's calculate this determinant using the Slater rule. And so then we see that the many body wave function for the two bosons is equal to um, one over square root of four is equal to one half to get the normalization correct. And now I'm gonna have psi A of x1 times psi A of x2. So I'm just doing this first diagonal here, psi a of x2. Now normally I would have minus psi a of x2 times psi a of x1, but the rule is that I turn the minuses into pluses, so I'll do it right now. Boom, that's it. That's the, that's the key thing. I gotta turn that minus into a plus. So now I see I have this plus that, and so this is equal, so then I see that the many body wave function of x1 and x2 is equal to um, psi a of x1 times psi a of x2. And here's the deal. This is, this is an allowed wave function for bosons. Because now you can see that if I hit this with the exchange operator, psi many body, and if I just exchange the labels one and two, I get the same thing. It's obvious. Just look at it, and you can see. And so that and so that's plus one. So that means that my my uh, eigen my eigenvalue for the exchange operator is plus one, and that's what you get for bosons. It works. It works. And what is the energy? Well, the energy is just going to be the energy of those two states, and it's going to be E A plus E A equals 2 ea you just add up the energy of each state uh, and and so i just want you to see that this is very different so this so this state is not allowed for fermions and so the point is is that is that if i even for the same potential I'm going to get very different states, very different, very different states 
and energies depending on whether I have bosons or fermions. Bosons or fermions. So whether the particles are bosons and fermions makes a big difference. Um, and we call this, so what we say then is we say that bosons and fermions have different statistics. That's the word we like to use. Because if you're counting these states and all these energies, uh, then you can see that the states and energies you count are going to be very different depending on the bosons and fermions. And, and this, is, this is, of course, the statistics that is very important for statistical mechanics. Now, this is not a class in statistical mechanics, but I just want you to see that this is the basis of statistical mechanics, that when you do statistical mechanics, you talk about, you, do, you count all the states and energies. That's what statistical mechanics is. Uh, but the basis of statistical mechanics is, is this, uh, um, is the, is quantum mechanics, what, what we just went through. Uh, and so I just want you to appreciate that. Um, and so now what we can do is we, we can ask ourselves, um, uh, what we can ask ourselves, are there any other effects? Are there any other effects of the symmetrization. What what uh, what else happens? Because we see that the symmetrization of the of the many body wave function is a really big deal. We just saw how it completely changes the statistics and the energy levels allowed for many body systems. But are there any other effects of the symmetrization? And the answer is yes, because the symmetrized structure of the many body wave function leads to actual physical consequences. There are physical consequences to the symmetrization. Physical consequences to the symmetrization of the wave function, symmetrization of psi. And when I say the symmetrization of psi, what I mean is like the fact that psi is equal to this weird, uh, you know, uh, Slater determinant. Right? It's this weird determinant, and that is the symmetrization, you know, is that this weird structure to the wave function that leads to actual physical consequences that you can measure. And I'll just mention that one of those physical consequences is magnetism. So the fact that things stick to your refrigerator is a consequence of the symmetrization of the many body wave function. Okay, and that's where we will stop for today. And so this, okay, so uh, I'll see you next time.